you feel about our I was even wondering if Marilyn, Marilyn would like to talk a little bit about her trip there and what it was like. And where is it? Where is that shrine? Sure, Marilyn, go ahead. It was in Haifa in Israel. Oh. What oh, year were you there? What year were you there, Marilyn? Uh, probably, I don't know, maybe 10 or 12 years ago. I actually lived in Israel for three and a half years as a public health nurse. But then I came back to the States and I wanted my uh, then husband to see Israel. We went with my uh, rabbi. The temple in New Jersey was going on a trip. And so we went with him and got to see a lot of the country. And one of the trip, it was a um, I think it was a two-week trip, and uh, one of the stops that we made was in Haifa at the Baha'i Temple, which is up on a hill. Um, many of the tourist brochures show it from the base at the bottom, and you've got this long, gorgeous expanse of st um, steps and lawn and trees, and it's just beautiful. And you get up there, it's a rather small building uh, room that you go into. I'm not sure how big the actual building is, uh, if you can see if there are other rooms within the building. We only went into the one room and there really wasn't a lot of information on the actual religion per se. So that's why I'm here now. I want to hear more about it. It seemed to me it was more of a universalist type religion that almost anybody could find a reason to uh, belong to it or to participate in it. I just found it a beautiful, beautiful area and very interesting and different. I am Jewish, but I found this very uh, different than anything I'd uh, read about before. And when I saw this coming up, I thought, oh, wow, now I can learn more about it. And I actually live in Massachusetts. I actually asked because I lived in Haifa for seven years. Oh, when were you there? Uh, 2006, 2013. Well, I was actually living in Israel in, two, in 1973. Okay. I went in January. I came back to the States for the Jewish holidays in September. And uh, my uh, head nurse had a brother who was in the consulate here and said, so if you have a problem, give my brother a call. Well, of course, that was the Yom Kippur War. I called him up. I said, I want to go back. He sent me to JFK Airport as um, on the wait list. He said, I'll make you number one. I got there, I flew back with all these very young, young soldiers who were all going back voluntarily and being called back. And it was the most strange period of time I think I've ever lived in when all the men were at war, all the women, children, and old men were in the cities, stores were closed, you couldn't get a lot of things. To this day, I remember having a couple of eggs and I accidentally dropped one and I cried because I knew I couldn't get any more. It was a very strange time. Well, hopefully you will get to learn much uh, about the faith and more of the detail of it tonight. Hello everyone. I'm glad to see everyone here. Hello, everybody. Nabil here. Oh, wonderful. Hi. Nabil and Melanie are will be also assisting with hosting tonight. They are Baha'i, they follow Baha'i faith. Uh, so they'll have a lot of wisdom for us. <laughs> uh, we're just doing introductions, uh, Garrett. Um, but Marilyn was nice enough to tell us about her experience when she visited a Baha'i temple. Okay. Yeah, I got to go to the one in Evanston. Um, it was incredible, very beautiful. Um, 
So yeah, Evanston, Illinois. I'm sure Melanie knows it, but for anyone else, if you Google <laughs> like Google Images Baha'i Temple in Evanston, Illinois, you'll see why I say how beautiful it was. <laughs> I'll give a little bit introduction, brief introduction, one slide about the temples and the Baha'i temples and their roles. Oh, good. We are, do you have a picture of that one? Yes. Oh, good. Then everyone gets to see it. Yeah, yeah I've been there a few times. Do you have a picture of the one in Haifa? I do. I can bring it up uh, in a little bit. When I start, I'll start with that. So, uh, Garrett, that reminds me. I, um, I I used to work with this guy who was based out of uh, Chicago, and uh, we were on a on a work trip, uh, and we went to India for work, and um, we were there for two weeks, and we were in Delhi and Hyderabad and Bangalore. You know, we were kind of doing a little tour. And um, and so we happened to spend the weekend in Delhi, and there's actually a, another temple uh, just outside of Delhi. And so um, I told them, uh, I was like, hey, I was like, you know, I'm planning on going to, you know, this Baha'i temple this weekend. And he was like, hey, he's like, can I come along? I was like, sure. So he didn't know anything, you know, about the Baha'i faith or the temples. And so he came, you know, he just kind of came along just to kind of see what it was. And when he when we went to the temple in, in Delhi, he was like, oh, my gosh, this is amazing. And then he was like, do you guys have any more of these temples around the world? I was like, yeah. I was like, we have one in the U.S. And he's like, where? I was like, it's in Wilmette. He's like, what? He's like, I live in Chicago. He's like, I've never seen this. And so when he went back home, he actually looked it up. And he and then he was uh, texting me pictures. He's like, this is amazing. Yeah. He's like, I didn't even know it was in my own backyard. No, it's incredible. It like looks like it's from something out of India. Like, yeah, it's beautiful. Um. So are we, uh, Ellis, were, were we doing social or did we just jump into um, like uh, the, here's the. This is a picture of the Baha'i Temple in Haifa. Cool. Just to kind of give you an idea of the gardens around it. Very beautiful. This is the temple. Yes, we were just going around as whoever, uh, we can continue with introductions. You can state where you're from and uh, your name and what interests you about tonight or how you're feeling today. Uh, you're welcome to jump in. <laughs> Michael, do you want to do an introduction if I can put you on the spot since you're an FTI member? And maybe tell people a quick sentence or two about your experience being an FTI member. Okay, my name's Michael. I live in Pennington, New Jersey, which is not far from Princeton. I've been a member of the FTI FTI for quite a while. Well, as long I think almost as long as it's been around, and I found it very rewarding. I've met some wonderful people, and I've also. <clears throat> It's helped me, I guess the best way I can put it in is it's given me some principles and some guardrails in my life um, to keep me a good person, if you will, and a, a, a directed person. And I'm interested in I enjoy the meetings we have, the FTI meetings, which are usually Sunday at early Sunday noon. And then I enjoy these meetings because I learn a lot. And there's a lot of good questions, a lot of good comments. And um, controversy is always welcome as long as it's done in a polite manner. And it leads to very good dialogue. And I find it um, elevating. Thanks. Thank you. Anyone else want to share a little bit about themselves and maybe their interest in uh, the event on the Baha'i Faith? Yes, I would love to know um, what brought other people here yeah. tonight. And so if anybody is willing to share, that would be wonderful. Hi. My name is Rayanne Weaver, and I'm from Somerset, Pennsylvania, which is in the southwestern corner. And the reason I'm here is 
for one thing, I'm a lifelong learner. And the other thing is I want to learn more about other people's faiths and cultures because I believe the more that we know about each other, the greater we can understand each other. Great. It's a good philosophy. Um, Katie, do you want to go next? Yeah, I think for me, one of my beliefs is that whatever the truth is should be accessible to everybody. So that's what always, um, and I feel like the Baha'i faith, since it promises some for every something for all of humanity, I'm I'm curious whether it lines up with my beliefs. Great. Yeah, the Baha'i events that I've gone to talked a lot about truth. So I have a feeling we're going to touch on that tonight. <laughs> so anyone else want to share a little bit of an intro of who you are, where you're from, and you know, a sense or two about you and what brought you to tonight's event? Uh, I usually go by cold. What's that? Um, yeah, I, I, have, I, have a, I have a few connections to well met where um, the uh, U.S. Baha'i temple is it. I think my aunt used to be Baha'i. Um, uh, and I don't know if she's or, or she may, oh, she was actually, she came a, a minister, what? maybe Presbyterian, I forget. Well, uh, what else? I just, I just want I just want to learn more about the high faith. Cool. Thank you. Anyone else want to share? We've got a quiet crowd tonight. You <laughs> see. I guess I'll jump in. Um, you know, for me, the thing that like I I long have felt like um, all religions, like I you know, I was gr grew up with my parents telling me, you know, you know, my dad was Jewish, my mom was Christian, and they both said, "You learn about the different religions and see which one's right for you, and um, and see you know see what you feel like following, if any." And they kind of gave me that freedom. And I took that freedom and I said, you know, gosh, I learned a lot from all these, you know, in the beginning, like I was kind of anti-religion, but um, as I learned more about religions and the wisdom that they had to offer, I said, wow, I don't like any one. I like all of them. And it turns out that's called an omnist and aligns really well with the Baha'i faith, which I learned about when I went to Evanston. That was when I first learned about the Baha'i faith. My friend was going to school out there and was like, oh, you know, there's this really cool temple. Do you want to go see it? And I said, sure. And I started reading all the plaques in the temple. And I was like, wait, this is like aligns with my beliefs. Like, like all the religions are good. Like, and there's no right one. And all the other ones aren't wrong. Because, you know, if you think about it, like theoretically, whichever, like if any one of those religions are right, everyone else is going to hell. And only the people of that religion are right. And that never felt exactly right to me. And so I see all religions as different paths to God and wisdom can be learned from all of them. And you can follow one if you want, if that makes you feel good. But I'm a big believer in learning wisdom from all sources, religious and non-religious, religious and secular. Um, and so, yeah, Baha'i has always resonated with me. And I try to go to the events that I can in New York, but given my schedule now, I, I don't get to go as often, that, uh, but I've gone to a number and I really like them. And that said, it's about seven. So I just filled the space to seven. So why don't I start off the intro? Um, so first of all, um, you know, I want to thank everyone for coming tonight. And um, uh, I'll introduce myself first. My name is Garrett Lang. I'm a software developer turned software inventor, now entrepreneur. Um, and my hobby is writing and discussing practical philosophy. I'm also the executive director of the Freethinker Institute. Um, this event is kind of brought to you by the Freethinker Institute. That's uh, This is our Tuesday night series. Um, we do these events every Tuesday night with a wide variety of subjects. Um, we are a not-for-profit looking to support and empower members 
um, to be the best version of themselves, seek truth, and to be fair through transformational, personal, and professional development. Um, and we have have these events every Tuesday where we cover things not typically taught in academia or industry. And we also have weekly only uh, weekly members only events to apply practical wisdom into our daily lives. Um, as Michael mentioned, he's a member of that. Um, and um, we're a small tight knit group of people. Um, and we'd love to welcome more people into the fold. So for people interested, I'll just posting information about that um, in the chat. And then we have only one rule in the FTI and that is to remain polite. That was mentioned by Michael. Um, we try to keep very low on rules. And I found that if we just stay polite, everything else works itself out polite and let people say whatever they want as long as they say it politely. And then we use logic and reason to make our, you know, make our points. Um, and so um, let's focus on uh, listen, what, doing what I call at the FTI, listening to understand, which is if someone has a very different belief than us, try to focus on listening to what their perspective is rather than trying to logically prove them wrong. You'll learn a lot more by understanding why someone else came to the conclusion that they did than you will proving them wrong. Um, and if you ask thoughtful questions that lead them to realize they were wrong in the first place, then you may actually convince them and you're far more likely to convince them than logically proving them wrong. Um, so that said, um, I do want to um, introduce um, the host for tonight. Um, I'm going to be helping facilitate a little bit, but um, the the stars of the show tonight are the the folks from the Baha'i Faith, which is Melanie, yeah. Beetle, and May. And so um, I do want to um, encourage everyone like uh, to hold questions until the end. That's kind of our uh, format by popular opinion so that the presenters can sort of Mom, I'm so, um michael you're not on mute so i'm going to mute you um so that uh, that'll let our presenters sort of present their full perspective without getting interrupted um and then you know save questions for the end i recommend taking notes that's what i do i save all i write all my notes down and then i ask the questions at the end although when you do ask questions try to ask one question at a time or make one point at a time because if you try to get everything into one conversation, then someone can't respond to that effectively. And it also doesn't give everybody a chance to speak. And so best to focus on one question at a time, start with the most important one first, although we usually get to almost all the questions in these events. So um, there should be plenty of time um, for, for questions. So um, with that said, um, I want to let Melanie uh, kind of present herself and her team. So, and I also want to thank them all for, for coming tonight and for presenting the Baha'i faith, because I think it's such, like I already said, like such a fount of wisdom and um, such a good perspective to have on the world. So thank you all for presenting it tonight. We really appreciate having you here. Thank you, Garrett. So I'm Melanie Danch Powell. Um, and career-wise, I have done everything from being an assistant director of a federal program to being an educator and director of private schools. Um, I actually found the Baha'i Faith when I was in um, high school. But my opening for that was that when I was in, when, when I was little, when I was in kindergarten, actually, my parents were very open to letting me research any faith I wanted to. So my mom took me to synagogues, different churches, and a mosque. And I think that openness allowed me to feel free to investigate further when I got older. Um, I won't tell the story here right now about how I became a Baha'i, but if anybody's curious about it, I'll be happy to share it during questions and answers. And I'd like to pass this on to Nabil. Thank you, Nabil. And thank you, Garrett. My name is Nabil Fanayan. I live in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, I'm a technologist, and I guess I'm a sucker for pain because a couple of years ago, I decided to start my own software company uh, just before the pandemic. So it was Great timing, uh, but it's been a wonderful journey so far. Um, and I was actually born into a Baha'i family and I was raised Baha'i, but I was actually raised overseas. I was raised in Venezuela. And then um, before things got pretty bad there, my family decided to move back to the States and I ended up in Atlanta for school. I fell in love with the city and I've been here ever since. So thank you for having us tonight. Bienvenidos. Mm -hmm. And I guess May. So my name is May Akhtar Um 
I am a mother of three children. I have I was born in Jordan of a family descendant Persian. I'm actually four generation Baha'i. Um, you know, it's uh, I'm passionate about the faith and the history. Uh, I am an engineer in profession. I'm a chemical engineer um, by education, and I've also done electrical engineering. So now I manage a, a environmental in a electrical engineering consultant. Uh, I am the director of the company. And um, one of the things I wanted to say that this presentation today, since as Baha'is, we do not have clergies, we do not have priests or mullahs, uh, we really, what we're sharing here is some of the knowledge that we have. It's almost like a drop of an ocean. Uh, and I really love this idea of a free thinking institute group. When, you know, when Melanie asked me to present, I was like, you know, I'm an engineer, not really, this is not my thing. So I was kind of a little bit nervous about it, but listening to you guys now, uh, it really truly feels at home. So I'm looking forward to sharing some of the information about the Baha'i faith and answering some of the questions. I'm gonna start by talking a little bit about the history because for me, you know, when we understand where things come from, it have more of a meaning to it. I'm going to talk a little bit about the principle of the Baha'i faith, which I think some of you had already uh, were familiar with and mentioned. I'm going to talk about a little bit who are the community and how do we influence uh, our society or what we call building the new civilization. So um, if you are ready, I am. So we'll go ahead and start. Actually, let me make sure that, um, let me make sure to stop sharing because I want to make sure when I uh, select share that I have a video that I wanted to share. So I wanted to add, okay. Can you see my screen? Yep. Okay, it is discussion. I know you guys had said to leave questions to the end which I think is great, but if you feel like you have a burning questions in the middle of something I have said, you know, it, I, I don't mind, but I, I like the idea of keeping it more of a discussion to the end, uh, but I do welcome. If you feel like I said a burning question or something that I had said really intrigue you, uh, please ask. Where did this whole thing started, right? The Baha'i faith, what's the beautiful thing about it is you know, somebody had mentioned that, I think Garrett had mentioned that um, he was interested in religion. And when he started learning about it, he found that it's all very similar. So the story of the Baha'i faith, it's similar to the story of many of the religion. It starts with declaration of a mission. Then, you know, we have a tragic persecution of the founder of the religion and of the member of the faith and how they overcome that challenge and how do they have an impact, a huge impact on the civilization. So the story of the Baha'i faith is not, you know, it's very similar to that. It started in 1844, a merchant by the name, um, you know, he was later were named the Ba, taking that name. And what means it's in the Arabic language, it means the gate because he was the gate to a new manifestation of God that was to become, where he later on had referred to him, to him who God shall make manifest, which is Baha'u'llah. The Bab was actually a merchant who declared his mission in 1844 in Iran. As soon as he declared his mission, many of the believers or the clergies of Iran had already been investigating and believing that the return of the Imam or whatever that they were looking through their manuscript was coming. So a huge population had believed in the Bab. That was really created a uh, threat to the make leadership. And that's where the story, the tragic story started of the persecution of the Baha'i faith. The Bab had written many books. He actually also established the Baha'i calendar. Uh, which we continue to use to this date. He also had written many tablets that referred and prepared people to the coming of the new manifestation of God. His 
ministry lasted only six years in Iran. He was uh, persecuted and he was actually publicly executed in a, in a very tragic way uh, that is documented in all the history of, of, the, of Iran, which is one of the, you know, really as Baha'is we believe it, it's one of the tragic things in the Baha'i faith. That persecution continued um, through, with Baha'u'llah, who was at that time leading the Babi community. And he was put in dungeon in a prison in Iran. Baha'u'llah was actually a son of a governor. At that time, it was really interesting. We're talking 170, 180 years, almost a year ago. At that time, when, when you have a governor, uh, after he passed away, his son will take that role. So he had actually the opportunity to become a governor of Iran at that time. And he had given that position away, which really shocked many of the people at that time and says, how could you, you know, who with their mind gave up such position? And Baha'u'llah said that that was not the material world was not what he was seeking. Through the persecution, the uh, you know, people were coming into the faith and investigating and searching for the truth. Baha'u'llah, they decided, the government had decided, okay, persecute, uh, you know, execution of the Bab did not make it. Let's go ahead and exile some of his believers out of Iran. And that will teach them a lesson and that will teach them a lesson and that will eliminate uh, the spread of the Baha'i, the Babi faith at that time. Baha'u'llah with a the, with the group of his families and Several of the Baha'is at that time were, were exiled to Turkey, to Adrianople and Constantinople. Same thing happened. It's a different language, a different culture. So they thought, okay, for sure, that's gonna be the end of it. However, the Baha'i, the Babi faith continues to spread. So the Uthman Empire with, uh, you know, with the rules of the Iranian government decided to exile even Baha'u'llah with, with the group to further to Baghdad, which is in Iraq now. And in 1863, that's when Baha'u'llah proclaimed his message as the messenger of God publicly. And that's where he had, uh, at that time, the faith was spreading as wildfire. The government became even more concerned. And they said, you know what? We've got to take care of this. So at that point, they exiled Baha'u'llah with his family to what's known in Akka. I think Mary, Mariel had mentioned that she was at the Baha'i Temple in Haifa. This was a location in Israel. That was a whole city that's basically surrounded by a wall where they had exiled the worst of the criminals of the Ottoman Empire. So you can imagine this noble family being executed, uh, being uh, you know exiled to a criminal city, and the challenge of it is, it was not just the men at that time. If you can imagine, you know, sending a family with the children, and they were actually put in a prison inside the prison city. The hardship um, and the stories, you know, as a Baha'i that we learn is really just, you know, it makes you just think. How could a humanity, something like this happen again, right? How do we let these things happen again? But with that, that is the reason why actually the Baha'i faith, the center of the Baha'i faith is in the Holy Land in Haifa, because that's where we have the central figure of the Baha'i faith, where they have passed away uh, in exile. In 1863, Baha'u'llah passed away. And in a document that's called the Will and Testament of Baha'u'llah, he appointed his son, Abdul Baha, as his successor. So everything that we had, we were so lucky that in the Baha'i writing, there is like things were clear, right? Writings were written, appoint, you know, the appointment was very, um, you know, there was no confusion about it. In 1892, Baha uh, Abdul Baha became the successor of Baha'u'llah and he led the Baha'i community. Not until uh, I think 18, uh, 63, when the 
uh, young Turkish um, revolution happened, that's when Baha, that's when Abdul Baha became free as a prisoner. So in, in 1819, uh, Abdul Baha actually had traveled across to the uh, to the United States to Europe, and at the age of 63, he came to the United States. You know, I, as you can imagine, you know, a Persian um, prisoner that come to the United States. He spoke in Oxford. He spoke in churches. He spoke in so many of the places. And he really, the purpose of his coming was to, to talk to the people about the message of Baha'u'llah. In, in 1921, after Abdul Baha passed away, he appointed the guardian, which is Shawai Afendi, which was the grandson, uh, as the guardian of the Baha'i faith. Um, he had led the Baha'i community and developed uh, basically more the institution process and develop the communities in the Baha'i world. In 1963, after the passing of Shawqi Afendi, the election of the Universal House of Justice, which is the reason I'm bringing that up because the Universal House of Justice is an elected body of the Baha'i world. And that's what really takes care of the administration of the Baha'i world. And that's when I said at the beginning that we don't have mullahs, we don't have priests, you know, none of us speak as individual, we really, all of us speaks as individual. So here I am tonight talking, I am just sharing some of the things that I, you know, um, that I see the Baha'i faith and really most of what I'm sharing here is factual. Um, the election of a Baha'i uh, Universal House of Justice was actually established in an outline by Baha'u'llah. And it was later on uh, depicted by Abdul Baha and Shoba Effendi. The guidance and the rules for the election is very clear. We do not campaign. The vote itself is very uh, confidential. However, the election is very open. So this gives you a little bit about who, you know, where and what things. So when I talk about writings in history, you know a little bit where this is coming from. I love the idea of a free thinking institute, right? That means, you know, it's really, you're out there and the Baha'i faith is open for everybody. Any of the writing of, of the Bab, Baha'u'llah and Abdul Baha, which is considered as the central figure of the Baha'i faith, uh, the writing is actually has been authenticated we're lucky enough that most of the writing, we have the original writing, we have the writing of our, you know, it's to me that has always been something fascinating that we actually have the writing in the hands of our manifestation of God. Uh, a lot of these writings were sealed um, and the ones that were written by a scribe were later on also authenticated and, you know, a seal was used for Baha'u'llah, the Bab and Abdul Baha. So to me, you know, that's something just fascinates me. Um, the fact also, as you could see how much writings we have, the amount of writing that's out there is unbelievable. We have a prayers for pregnant women. We have a prayers for the morning. We have a prayers for the evening, you know. Um, we have guidance. The book of Baha'u'llah, we have a book of laws where it talks about how should we live our life, right? Uh, chaste life to have, you know, um, it's more of like, how do we build also like a whole new world civilization? All of the principles that I'm gonna talk about, all of these were, you know, we have the writings and guidelines that we will go through and we investigate the truth, we study it, we learn it together. One of the things that you will see in the Baha'i community is, you know, very similar. And that's what I said, it feels like home being with the FTI is, you know, we study things and we learn things together. That's kind of one of the cultures that you will learn. One of the writing that's really fascinated me that I thought would be interesting were when Baha'u'llah was exiled to Adirna, to Adrianople, and through his exile to Akka. You can imagine, right? This nobleman who's being through exile, who's going through this, he's taking the time to write letters to the leadership of the world. 
So in 1863, started in Adrianople, which is in Turkey uh, today, and in Akka, which is in Israel. Baha'u'llah actually wrote letters to the leader, to the kings and rulers of the world. He sent, as you can see in the screen, he sent to some of them were Napoleon, he sent to Alexander, to, uh, you know, to the Pope, he sent it to the Sultan Abdul Aziz, he sent it to Nasr al-Din Shah. These, the purpose of these letters, which we can, we call them actually the tablets to the kings, is Baha'u'llah we proclaim his station as the messenger of God. He urged the leader to pursue justice and disarmament. Again, blocking myself with the picture. I've exerted them to band together into a commonwealth of nation, warning them of the dire consequences should they fail to establish peace. So he gave them, you know, when you think about it, he gave them the opportunity to bring world peace, right? Many of them, uh, the only one who had responded positive was Queen Victoria. The rest actually had, you know, uh, had executed whoever carried that message and many of them had taken it lightly. So it lifted for us now, uh, you know, since the rulers of the world did not take on creating the peace to the world. So we believe that it's the responsibility of all of us, Baha'is and non-Baha'is to take on that roles. So that's the fundamental belief of the Baha'i faith. Uh, what are some of the principles of the Baha'i faith? As you could see, we have lots of principles, but one of them is the oneness of God. So it doesn't really matter as, you know, we believe it doesn't matter what you call him, Allah, what, you know, the Lord, whatever you call him, we believe that there is only one God. It's like the sun, right? And the source of knowledge to humanity is through him. We believe of the oneness of religion. Uh, the concept of progressive revelation is really fascinating for me. Um, as a Baha'i, you know, my parents had put me through Catholic school and through Muslim school because they believed that, you know, it's my role to really um, learn and investigate the truth. So when, you, when we talk about progressive revelation, we don't talk about like one prophet being better than the other. We look at it as if you're looking at the sun and you put mirrors, each of these mirrors will reflect the true beauty of that sun. And they all have the same reflection. So all the manifestation of God, we believe that they have the same knowledge and they have the same message. However, they came into the world at a different time. So for example, you cannot talk about differential equation with a fifth grader, right? You have to teach them math. You have to teach them multiplication, you know, for those of us who are educator. That's the same concept. Not that the teacher doesn't have that knowledge, is whoever is receiving it does not have the capability to understand that message. And that's why the principle for each of these religion are, you know, the fundamental is the same. The golden rule at the basic, the foundation of all religion is all the same, right? But can you imagine when Jesus Christ had come and he had, he's gonna talk to people about universal language, He's going to talk to them about, you know, world peace. For them, their tribe was their, or what they can't comprehend, right? When Muhammad came, the tribes were worshiping idols, right? They were burying their daughters alive um, because of the situation there. So he couldn't talk about the equality of men and women. For them, it was beyond their comprehension. So he gave it to them to the level that they could understand. So this is the concept of what we believe in progressive revelation. Melanie, do you mind reading the quote, please? Sure, and can I add one thing, May? Please. Um, when we talk about manifestations of God or prophets of God, who we're referring to are um, ones like um, Jesus, Buddha, Krishna, Moses, um, the Bab, Baha'u'llah, uh, Muhammad. So those are, yes, thank you. Those are all examples of the 
prophets of God. And when we talk about the progressive revelation, we look at it in terms of like, also another way to look at it was like in terms of a chapters of a book where each revelation came, gave a moral message to the people, but then gave other messages to the people also that were applicable to that day and time. And so we believe that all these religions are valid religions from God. And just the most recent one we believe is Baha'u'llah's religion centered on the unity of all mankind. So here's the quote. Know ye not why we created you all from the same dust, that no one should exalt himself over the other. Ponder at all times in your hearts how ye were created. Since we have created you all from the one same substance, it is incumbent on you to be even as one soul, to walk with the same feet, eat with the same mouth, and dwell in the same land, that from your inmost being, by your deeds and actions, the signs of oneness and the essence of detachment may be made manifest. No, I, I thank you, Melanie. So oneness of humanity, right? Understanding this concept in the Baha'i faith, it talks about us being created noble, right? And when it talks about us, it talks about human being. So we do not really, we cherish um, diversity. We see diversity, but at the same time, we also believe that every have the same human rights. You know, it's really interesting because each of these principles, and I think, you know, Melanie had elaborated more in that one, but each of these principles, I'm just kind of trying to give you a glimpse, right? A taste of, of some of these principles. But in reality, we can take each of the principles and we can spend hours really understanding and reading some of the quotes on these principles and talking about what implementation it has truly on our life and how do we achieve these principles. So, uh, you know, having an hour to explain a whole religion is kind of like, I feel like I will never do justice to it, but it, it will give you enough glimpse to, to, uh, to light up your curiosity, hopefully, so you can go and investigate the truth for yourself. So the equality of man and woman. Um, Nabil, do you mind? Uh, reading the first quote, please. Sure. The world of humanity has two wings. One is woman and the other men. Not until both wings are equally developed can the bird fly. Could one wing remain weak, flight is impossible. This is, you know, one of my uh, really, uh, you know, it's this idea of you know, we're not exactly the same, we're two separate wings, but at the same time, unless we both are developed to the way where we are strong, right? So this idea of having a man drag the woman or the woman drag the man, is just not going to work for us. If we want humanity to flourish, if we want us to take us to the next level, we have to have a true equality between man and woman. Harmony of science and religion, you know, being a more of a scientist, this is something that's really fascinating for me because the idea of science, really, when you think about it, you think of what can we do intellectually and material and what scientifically can we develop? And, you know, this is such an amazing age that we're living in where, you know, we've gone to the moon, we have invented nuclear power plants, we've you know, we've conquered the sea, we've conquered the wind, we've used them, we used all of these things to our needs. But if you really take the religion out of that, that's where we end up, where we are, the power, the ego, right? This concept of, you know, I can conquer the world, I can take more of the countries, the wars, right? And this is just, again, my personal feel is, if we let science to just lead by itself, right, is where, where can we end? The same thing, if religion by itself, without an implementation to our needs of science, right, where would that take us? We do believe as Baha'is that prayers are very powerful for healing, right? That's one example that always comes to my mind when I think of science and religion. But also Baha'u'llah said that you should seek 
the best of medical when you need that, right? So this concept of religion, we can sit in the corner and say, hey, I'm going to pray day and night to get better, right? That's where that could take us. So this is how I think of it. You really need both. Just like you have a man and a woman as two wings of a bird, the same thing in my mind is science and religion. They should go hand in hand for us to have the balance in our earth. Universal compulsory education. I know Melanie can talk about that forever, <laughs> but education in the Baha'i faith is not just what we think of education. It's not how many degrees can we obtain it's not how many books can I read alone, right? It's education is more, it's a moral, it's a spiritual, it's a scientific education. It's all of that together, right? So the school is doing a great job. You know, um, the public school now can teach. They have advanced classes, the universities, you have online classes, you have YouTubes, right? We're in society that education is starting to become, right? more and more available even to like you know you you know 10 years ago before when we went to school right we didn't have the access to the things we have now but what about spiritual and moral education right how does that what are we doing to to balance that with the education you know there's one of the stories in the baha'i faith that talks about if we have a choice of a moral or, you know, material, Abdul Baha talks about, you can have somebody so educated without the spiritual education that they could use it, their education like the people who invented the bomb, right? The people who have all of these weapons for the war. However, the spiritual education will balance that. So this is as a Baha'i what we're really trying to work on now. Universal auxiliary language. It is clear in the Baha'i writing that we should have a universal language. It was not actually, you know, Baha'u'llah did not say you should use this language, but he said you should pick as nation, as on the earth, you should pick a language that everybody should be able to speak it. That doesn't mean that we don't speak our original language, right? That doesn't mean I'm no longer gonna speak Arabic or we're not gonna speak English or French or whatever your language. We're keeping all of that, but having a language that we can all communicate with is essential as the words become more one. And I think somebody here mentioned at the introduction is the more we understand each other, the more we respect and the more, you know, um, we'll have less challenges. Uh, invest, independent investigation of the truth. I think it's something uh, that fits really, you know, it, I feel like it's another name for FTI, right? It's a way of seeing things, you know, Baha'u'llah said that we should see things through your own eyes, not through the eyes of others. How is it that we see things through our own eyes, right? If somebody tells me something and my heart, my eyes, my learning my, is, not, is not really matching. I, it's my responsibility as a human being to go investigate the truth. I can't just believe if somebody comes and tell me, you know, so-and-so is this and that. And I'm like, I have to come with this conclusion, you know, and, and this is one of the things that we wanted to make it clear here that we are sharing, right? We're not trying to push anything. We're just sharing our beliefs and it is, you know, we feel it's everybody's responsibility to investigate the truth. Elimination of extreme of wealth and poverty. Uh, Garrett, do you mind reading that quote at the bottom, please? Happy to. The fundamentals of the whole economic condition are divine in nature and are associated with the world of the heart and spirit. The disease which afflicts the body politic is lack of love and absence of altruism. You know, I, I'm going to say this is my favorite quote about every quote, but this is like about my kids. This is my favorite stage. My husband keep asking me, like when somebody <laughs> says, what's your favorite? I'm like, oh, this stage is my favorite. That's it. But, you know, as an engineer, when you think about eliminating extreme wealth and, you know, poverty, you immediately start thinking like, OK, you know, what can I put in place? Right. What structures, what order, what's process, what processes, right? What things can we do? But here, Baha'u'llah make it so simple. He said, 
the fundamental of the whole economic condition. He's saying the solution is love and altruism. Altruism, I think it's, you know, doing deeds without being selfish, right? Without, for no alternative reason. And I think when you really think of that, if our world and society truly become that, we will not have any poverty because nobody will be comfortable living in their millions of million mansions and knowing that somebody child is out there or somebody's out there starving, right? It's just not comprehend, you know, it's not something that we will accept as humanity. So if we reach that level, we do not need all of these things, despite the fact that as a Baha'is, we do have ways and means, like we do have the fund, which is the Baha'i faith, you know, only Baha'is are allowed to pay for the fund because it looked at as privilege. We're not out to collect money from everybody or solicit money. But that money is used for the betterment, the spiritual education, and you know, in case there is catastrophes in the world, that money is used to help. So I'm not saying you know we should be just all lovey-dovey and forget about things, but it's beautiful to read something that says love and altruism is the solution. You know, it's uh, it's fascinating. So coming to probably some of your favorite parts, Baha'i temples. These are some of the Baha'i temples uh, in the world. Uh, you know, the first one actually, what the first one that was built was built in Iran, which makes sense because that's where Baha'u'llah, that's where the largest population was. However, you know, sadly to the Baha'i community that that temple no longer exists. That temple was actually uh, destroyed uh, by, the, by the Iranian government because it is, um, it's a temple for the Baha'is and Baha'is to this day are still persecuted. Many are being killed just because, you know, for no other reasons except for being Baha'is. To this day, um, Baha'i youth are not allowed to go. If you put in your application that you're a Baha'i, you're not allowed to go to the university in Iran to this day. So, but on the positive side, these Baha'i temples, these are places for all. I, and when we say all, we don't say about all Baha'is. This is for all humanity to come and have a place of peace to pray together and to have uh, spirituality together. However, these have a lot more in the future, right? What we are trying to establish is these are to be subsidized humanitarian branches that could include hospitals, schools, universities, hospice and shelters. So for those who have been to the Baha'i Temple in Chicago, we did have like a building for the nursing home. So the idea is outside the outstrip of the Baha'i Temple, you will have school, university, hospice, all of these things are the basic fundamental need for a community to establish. And that's what we're working toward. And you can see the one thing that all of these have in common are beautiful gardens, are elements of waters, elements of the light into them. They also have nine doors, which these nine doors represent that you can actually enter from any sides of the Baha'i Temple uh, and everybody is welcome. Uh, for those who had seen inside the Baha'i Temple in Chicago, um, you will see a lot of the Baha'i principle that we had talked about are also on the columns of the temple inside to remind us that these are the foundation uh, of our Baha'i principles. And the Baha'i community is about 8.5, you know, as of three years ago. Numbers is not something that we like crazy about. So we're not constantly, you know, it's not about numbers. It's really about working with different group of people that we could establish the new civilization. So it doesn't really matter if you're calling yourself Baha'i, Jewish, Christian, Buddha, Zoroastrian, Muslim, you know, uh, as long as we're all trying to achieve the same goal is, is our, you know, uh, our aim. The Baha'i faith is actually the second most spread religion in after Christianity, which is which is interesting for you know a new religion, but it has been taken to almost all part of the world. Let me see. Am I good with time still? 
Yeah. So I'm going to give you some highlight of, uh, and if we have time, actually, I can share some pictures from our community, but to give you some of the core, we talked about education and spiritual education. We do get our, a lot of our guidance from the Universal House of Justice. The Universal House of Justice says this is the time for us to establish certain things, to focus on you know, spiritual prayers, to focus on this. And that's what the Baha'i community all over the world actually will work toward. There's this, the core activities of the Baha'i community. This is quote from the Universal House of Justice. It says, educational process, with three distinct stage appears. The first for the youngest member of the community, the second for those in the challenging transition years, and the third of youth and adult. So we actually do have a program, and I hopefully my link will work. Can you see my screen? Yep, uh, core activities is what's showing right now. Okay. Can you see the supporting the core activity with picture of children? Mm -hmm. I see pictures of children. Yeah. Okay. So, Mary, and this is just. So, okay. Sorry, when you when you clicked on the link, nothing came up. Okay, so I might have to because I think what mm -hmm. I did is I shared the presentation. So if you guys don't mind, just give me yeah, one. Yeah, try second. sharing your screen instead of the presentation. Yes, so I need to share a screen, my messy screen. It makes you feel better. You probably don't have more tabs than I do up. <laughs> it is. Yes, okay. Okay, so um, let's try again. Can you see it loading now? Now yes. it's loading. One second. So this is just one of the website, but as you could see, everything we have we, for the children classes, we we actually do have a different grades, grade one, which is five to six, and then six to seven, seven to eight, eight to nine. So we do have curriculum that we're working. And one of the first one, which is one of my favorite, is you could see these are each one of these is a lesson, and this is for grade one. That's where we start working with the children. And each lesson consists of a story, of a quote, and art project, and music for this age. Later on, we develop drama and other things that the kids get involved with. But for example, let's take truthfulness, right? We talk about truthfulness as the foundation of all human virtues. We talk to the kids about it. What does it mean to you? let them build a structure where the foundation is the truthfulness and if you remove truthfulness what happened to that you know block of buildings right so each of these you know love justice purity we really it's designed to be for everybody and 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 these are things that we talk about and work with the neighborhood for example in my house every saturday we have about 20 to 25 children from the neighborhood who will come and we will go through these classes and we will break them based on their age. For the junior youth, there is an absolutely, and this is where it talks about the uh, challenge transition years, right? This program is just absolutely, you know, my, my son and Nabil's son, for example, are going through, through those now and for that, you know, they learn about, these are the various books that they study. They study Breezes of Confirmation, Wellspring of Joy, and through stories and through example and through consultation, they talk about with the group and they learn how to present with each of these books. They will have to do also service project and community project. They look at the reality of their community and they together as a junior youth decide, how can we make a difference, right? Uh, one of my favorite is the our kids are now doing thinking about numbers, uh, but one of my favorite is habits of orderly mind. Right, so it's you know it's it's teaching spirituality, but we're not preaching like you know we're teaching them how to become hum human being who are useful to society. For the adults, we have 
curriculum also that we sit together and we you know we don't have a teacher we call them a facilitator that we have a books it's basically what it is it's a selection of the Baha'i writing that reflect on the spirit the life of the spirit and we talk about like you know the same thing that the children talk about for example <clears throat> the same quote is truthfulness that we teach the kid truthfulness is the foundation for all human virtues how does that really impact us you know and it's really fascinating because you have people, you know, we had a group from Venezuela that from the neighborhood that we're talking and said, you know, a whole society collapse when you can't, you know, when people don't trust each other and they were giving examples and you're like, wow, you know, we're just like, it's things that you really never imagined. We also go arising to serve. That's one of the second book. The third one is whoever go through their children classes, you know, also have an opportunity to become children class teacher. Uh, you know the twin manifestation it talks really about the history of the baha'i faith in that one but the uh, the book five where it talks about the junior youth and to kind of help somebody prepare to be the junior youth so none of these is really just for the baha'is right walking together on a path of service family and community uh, engaging in social action participating in pu public discourse so all of these is just provide a quote for us and space just like you come together every Tuesday it provides a space for us where we come together and conflict you know reflect on the writing and how can we put them in action and how does it mean for our community Baha'is, non-Baha'is, you know everybody. Um, this here is one other resources that you know, this is the behind news, but that gives you a little bit of an idea of what are some of the things that come, you know, uh, this is very exciting for the Baha'i world, but a, a new house of worship in the Dominican Republic of Congo was just opened uh, last week. So this is everywhere in the Baha'i news. It's, it's and the stories, it's just really fascinating. But some of the, you know, some of the things that happening all over the world, right, that comes out of the study group. For example, this one here, I, a friend of mine in Bahrain, they are working within different tribes who have a conflict between themselves and they kind of being the facilitator and they're providing consultation, teaching them how to consult, right? It's not to go this, kill this, then we have to revenge, this is never ending. And this really, that's part of the culture there. And they trying to change that. And the government had actually realized how impact that has on their society. It's it's truly changing whole societies by just using some of these basic fundamental principles. Um, so this is just a space where you can see some of these things that's happening. You know, Black History Month, House of Worship, Foster Oneness, uh, woman engagement in reimagining digital technology. So these are just some of the things that come. So you could see that this is just really, you know, not just that we're sitting there and reading and studying and over and over, right? We're trying to make action and changes to our society. Okay, I think I am good for the next 10 minutes. Is that correct? Yeah, you can keep going for another 10 minutes. Feel free. So um, I was actually there. This was a, an amazing experience for me that I wanted to share. But this is, I was there election of the Universal House of Justice in, in the Holy Land. And, you know, you could see the diversity and unity uh, of the Baha'i world. Um, 19 members from, you know, and you can really learn more on, uh, online about the election of the local spiritual assembly, the national spiritual assembly, which leads to the election of the Universal House of Justice, which are the nine members that reside in the Holy Land. But out of each country, out of each nation, nine members will come through a complete uh, open voting, yet it is uh, secretive, confidential. So we are not share like, you know, we don't share, we don't campaign, but people just out of reverence and respect will elect these members. And um, it's fascinating that a place like Belize will have exactly the same nine members electing uh, votes as the United States, as um, 
you know, Mexico, as China, as Russia. And this, this just shows you a little bit about uh, the Baha'i faith and who we are as a community. This is one of the quotes that's one of my favorite in Matthew 7, 15, 20. You will know them by their fruits. So some of the things that you could see that the Baha'i community are involved with, that the Baha'i community are in the background trying to foster and develop. Uh, I wanted to share this five minutes video with you. Um, and it's more kind of connected you can relate to as a as a you know community in the United States. This is the establishment of the Maryland Baha'i Share. Please let me, please let me. Thank you all so much for joining. Can you hear it? Yes. Okay. So it's a four point four and a four forty five minutes video us this evening for this celebration of the 30th anniversary of the Baha'i Chair for World Peace. Delighted to see so many of you here tonight and to be with you tonight. Um, so many familiar faces and old friends. 30 years ago, the University of Maryland reached out to the Baha'i community with an idea. What if we partner together, applying essential human principles to engage with the world's largest problems? That simple inquiry was the start of a remarkable partnership that has resulted in a breadth of knowledge promoting the interests and well being of humanity. Through the rigorous examination into the roots of systemic racism and the causes of prejudice, to investigation of the structures that create women's inequality, to the impediments that restrain us from having a truly global system of governance and leadership, and to the causes of climate change, environmental injustice, and the challenges of human nature. We are interdisciplinary because modern life can only be understood from multiple perspectives. We are not looking to find the best practices for a particular side. Rather, we are looking to build a storehouse of human knowledge, human accomplishment, and human possibility. All of these events have been dedicated to the pursuit of knowledge, the pursuit of peace, and the pursuit of a better world for humanity. Throughout college, I took 35 classes, but there is only one that changed the fundamentals of how I look at the world. I was lucky enough to walk into Dr. Bob Moody's honor seminar my first week at the University of Maryland back in 2016. It was here that I learned how different the world looks outside of Howard County, Maryland. My relationship with the chair has fundamentally changed me into a more aware, selfless and thoughtful person. However, I am just one of the countless young adults shaped by the work of Dr. Mahmoudi and Dr. Steven. Through education and discussion, they are building a more equitable future one young mind at a time. In this particular seminar, I saw students truly grow and become introspective. And at the end of the semester, we might not have single-handedly solved the problem of prejudice, but we began to lay the groundwork to initiate a lifelong dialogue that will need to be revisited time and time again. And I just want to close by reading a part of her chapter in our book, because I think it really speaks to the work that we've done, and it really speaks to the work of the Baha'i Chair for World Peace. Hoda says, quote, at its heart, racial injustice is a spiritual problem that threatens the secular success of the American state. As a fundamentally immaterial challenge, racial justice echoes concepts of human dignity. That applies to all human beings. The processes of peace, and even more importantly, the yearning for peace, is our most human attribute. In choosing the paths of peace, we choose the best of all we are, and the best of all we can be. For in choosing peace, we lay the first stone towards the construction of a new world. And the laying of the stones of peace fires the imaginations of those today and those to come. 
but simply to imagine peace is to imagine a new world. The successes of peace will come from all of us, and us comprised of the fellowship of the willing. The work of peace will come from a collaboration of those dedicated to toiling in unison, regardful of the past while being fully in the present and with a mind to the future. We invite you to help us imagine such a new world of peace. Thank you. And, you know, this is uh, one of my favorite quotes. Uh, so powerful is the light of unity that it can illuminate the whole earth. And this is something we truly believe. And this will not be a true Baha'i presentation unless I had included some music. Uh, in the Baha'i right, it says, you know, one of the quotes that it says, we verily have made music as a ladder for your soul, a means whereby they may be lifted up unto the realm on high. And this is one of our youth had taken one of the Baha'i quotes and put it to music that I would like to share with you. and would open after that for questions. Sorry, it's hopefully loading. Yes, we can't avoid the ads. Can you hear it? Yeah, go ahead. Thank you. Yeah. 
hope this answers some of the questions you have. There are some, there's uh, Ginny's, Ginny's hand went up, went up before mine, and then I want to do a few reflections of, you know, some interesting parallels between the Baha'i faith and the FTI, but I want to let Ginny go first because she had her hand up first. Oh, thank you, Garrett, really. I mean, you're the host, but I just want to, I just want to say what a wonderful topic and what a wonderful presentation and and uh, that's all I can say. I mean, and Garrett, I just want to thank you for these fabulous topics and presentations that you bring in. Uh, I really appreciate that. Um, I mean, I've, it, I just feel like if I were to choose any religion, this would be the uh, religion I would choose. If you want to call, is, is this called a form of religion? I, it is. It is, it is form of universal religion. That is, I see it. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, Jenny. Yeah, I, and I appreciate everyone. Uh, I appreciate it. Ellis actually was the one that connected me with Melanie to do tonight's event. So I want to thank Ellis for that. Um, so I wanted to comment on like a bunch of things that I heard that I find really interesting parallels. Um, one is the, um, I forget what it was called, the, the independent investigation of truth, how like each individual is responsible for finding the truth. We have what we call the five intentions of the Freethinker Institute, and the first three are all aimed at like, you know, being the best. The first one is aimed at being a, the best version of yourself, seeking truth and being fair. Number two is like to transparently share your beliefs with other people, basically so that they can learn from you, but also point out when you're wrong. And then open mindedness is part of the second intention to learn when you are wrong and be open to that possibility. And then the third intention is to hone your critical thinking skills. So you can get better at that judgment between fact and fiction and wisdom from folly. And so I have a very, you know, kind of prescriptive method of coming to truth um, that I, you know, try to hold as the common values of the organization um, in the, the five intentions. Those are the first three. Um, and I can talk about other ones later if there's time. Um, and then eliminating poverty. One of the FTI's missions is um, to create a world where everybody makes enough money that money no longer buys happiness which is around 95,000 USD a year. And I'd like to see um, in equal purchasing power parity that vision realized around the world someday. Um, and part of my goal of starting the organization is to create a snowball effect where we enable that. Um, I don't mind extreme wealth, but I do mind extreme poverty. Um, I don't care how wealthy someone gets as long as everybody has enough money that more money won't make them happier. That's to me the bar that we should be striving for and seems like a universally appealing one. And a hundred years from now, that's not only achievable, we would be completely un unethical to not achieve that a hundred years from now with the way that efficiencies are going. Um, but right now we're not headed in that direction, quite frankly. And then the harmony of science and religion, I held an event last year on my essay on how science and religion can be um, in congruence with each other. Um, instead of in com conflict with each other, which is essentially when science has a good answer, use that. And when it doesn't, then consult spirituality and religion and non-science, I call it, um, which is other belief systems. And then um, I, I liked the idea that the Baha'i leader was writing to world leaders, encouraging world peace. I also held an event on that earlier this year on my recipe for world peace, which if anyone's curious about, I can do a recap of later. But I think I have a good way to end on just world unjust wars in the world. Um, and then, um, you know, if there's a way to get in touch with the um, the chair on peace, you know, I would love to share those ideas with someone in the Baha'i organization to sort of filter them up, because I think they're ideas that if they were, they're very easy to put into action, it just requires the right politicians to take action on them. And I think we could literally end unjust wars. So with that said, um, those were kind of my comments on, um, you know, the commonalities. I think there's a lot of commonality between um, the Baha'i faith and what I'm trying to do with the FTI. So, Marilyn, do you want to go? Uh, I don't know if, if May or Melanie, you have any comments on any of that? No, I, uh, I actually wanted to answer, I, I the, uh, the chair uh, is very close friend of mine, so I can, you know, send some information, whatever you need, and we'll connect and we can send an email. Uh, but it is also working within whatever your close community. And I think that's 
really more meaningful is to connect with the Baha'i community in your area and then to work together because that's also the more purpose of you know the, the local communities. Uh, there was a question here on the chat that asked about why was Israel not one of the countries listed in your first slide? The what you saw in Israel is actually a Baha'i temple, is, is a shrine, is not a temple. Uh, so that was a different why I did not list them as one of the temp, you know, one of the Baha'i temples. That these are shrines. There was one in Akko and one in Haifa. The one in Haifa is for the Bab and Abdul Baha which now actually the Baha'is are building shrine to Abdul Baha in, uh, in Akko. Uh, and the one which is the most holy place for the Baha'is is in beautiful gardens and shrine in Akko. And that is for where uh, our prophet Baha'u'llah had laid to rest. And over that is a shrine where the Baha'is go to pilgrimage. So the Holy Land is a, is, is a holy place for the Baha'is and these, what you have seen when you were there, are, are shrines. And that's why I did not list them as temples. So I wanted to ask if I don't live in Chicago, which I don't, how do you become involved in the Baha'i faith and teachings and these classes you were talking about? Uh, you know, Nabil or Melanie, please jump in. But in any of these classes, we do have uh, any of these classes virtual. So, you know, if you reach out to Melanie, myself or Nabil, we can connect you and in, in anybody who's teaching. But we can also, you know, look into your community and see we have what's called the local spiritual assembly. And those are elected nine members of, you know, each community, like in Roswell here we have a local spiritual assembly that's actually meeting tonight and they are the one who will guide you and will connect you to the community and most of the time you know if the community is large enough they will have a website or they will have in the internet presence where all of almost all of our activities are open to the public so so, could you put on the chat somehow how one looks that up or how yeah, to get in touch with one of you um yeah, yeah i can take care of that okay so That's you can Nabil will do that and also you can put www.bahai.org and they will also connect you but nabil will leave the information on the chat okay. thank you we also have um in our area we also have what we call meaningful conversations milton and that's where we discuss different topics um based on bahai writings but open to everyone with every viewpoint uh, you know, that people want to share. And if you look up on Facebook, Meaningful Conversations Milton, um, and Nabil, if you can put that in the chat too, that'd be great. Um, that's another way to get a hold of um, us too. Great, so I have another question since there are no hands up, I'm gonna ask it. I have some memory, and this might be from a Baha'i event in New York, that there is a prophecy that a or the Baha'i leader, I don't know if that's the Messiah, will come back uh, and that when they do, there's some apartment in Manhattan that they get. And I don't know if that's like, like someone made that up or like where I'm getting yes. this memory from, but um, ChatGPT didn't know about it. So it might just be a false memory. And then um, there was supposed to be some like apartment that they get. And then I was, I asked the question of like, how do they know if they will come? And they said that they're going to come explaining the meaning of life. Is that like just a totally false memory or does that resonate at all? You know, it's very interesting. Sometimes I think some factual Abdul Baha. And I think I mentioned at the age of 66 when he was no longer a president, which is the son of, uh, of Baha'u'llah actually did, did visit uh, several of the cities in the United States. And he had talked and many people had referred to him as you know, the coming of the Messiah and whatever, because of the power of the, his words that he was teaching. And that could be the confusion uh, on, on some of the things that, that is there. And, you know, the talks about the coming back. The Baha'i faith do believe that, you know, as we believe in the progressive revelation, we do believe that in a thousand of a year or more than that, a new manifestation will come 
when things are different and he you know he will come in the same way that Baha'u'llah come not to change the other message you know the message from the other the manifestation of God at the continuation right we don't know uh, with the way civilization and the nation and the human are evolving we don't know where we're going to be at that time that things that we might not understand now will be applicable at that time and we believe that as a Baha'i we believe that um, the different manifestations the different prophets came to different people at different time periods you know, to fulfill their needs and give the remind them of the the virtues that we need to all work on developing but that when Baha'u'llah came, he came to not only do that, but also unite the world, unite mankind. So here we've taken a slightly bigger step from just uniting certain areas or whatever to actually realizing that, that we are all one humankind. We are all, our religions are from God. And we are all worshiping the same God, whether we call God Allah or, or Jehovah or God or our spiritual you know, mentor, whatever. Um, so that's what we uh, believe. Got it. Thank you. So I think I must have some false memory there. Jose, you have your hand up. Yes, hi. Uh, I'm from Toronto in Canada, and uh, the only time I heard Baha'i before was because it was a sign at a corner of a street, and uh, I thought it was a construction company. <laughs> and it was the last. It was the last thing. Um, <laughs> it was the last thing I remember of Baha'i, and until now. Right? And the reason why I thought about uh, construction companies because many of the construction companies in that area of town were Persian. So I was convinced it was a construction company. <clears throat> now, it is, it is a construction company, the, the construction of peaceful peace, philosophy, and unity. <laughs> okay. And um, let me ask you this. What is the, the conception of God in the Baha'i religion? I mean, Melanie was talking about uh, diverse forms of the religious leaders, I guess. But what's the conception of a, of a god in the um, Baha'i religion? I'll start it out if you, the rest of you want to add in afterwards. Um, that God is an unknowable essence. We believe that God is so far above us that we can only really know what God wants for us through his manifestations, through these different religions, and that um, that's how we learn what God's message is for us for each day and age. Um, and May and, and Nabil, if you want to add into that. You know, also, yeah. go ahead, Nabil. Yeah, yeah, I just, I just wanted to add to that. I mean, that, that's, you know, like with everything that we've discussed tonight, any one of these these layers, we could pull back and, and just have a, you know, dedicated discussion for hours. But for me, the, um, you know, just to add on to what Melanie said, it, it, it's almost like um, if you think of the analogy of, uh, you know, flowers in a garden and we are all flowers and, you know, we're, we're doing our thing. We're growing, we're, we're taking in nutrients from the soil, you know, we're enjoying the rays of the sun. And then there's the gardener, right, who's tending the garden. The flowers have no concept of the gardener. There, there's no, it's, it's impossible. It's impossible for the flowers to know anything about the gardener. But they know that they're growing and they're developing and they're in a, you know, in, in a great habitat and something, you know, is providing that for them. Um, so that's kind of how I personally uh, view the relationship of, I guess, man and, and God. If I can add okay. just one more thing too. Um, oh, can you see this? I don't know. I can't, probably can't see it. It's too close. Yeah. Okay. Well, if you can see this, this is actually my wedding ring. It's of a high ring. It has, there's three lines, one in the top, one in the middle, one in the bottom, and then a line going straight down through them. And those three lines, the top one stands for God. The middle one stands for the manifestations of prophets of God. And the bottom one stands for mankind. 
And the line that goes down the middle is the Holy Spirit that connects us all together. Um, that helps understand the concept. Yeah. But um, just a comment now, as opposed to a, a question. I've, uh, I'm an amateur, I guess, investigator of philosophy and religions. And what I find is that when you dig enough, all the religions have the same tree trunk. Right. And every religion is just one branch. So the problem, I, I grew up Catholic. I grew up in, in South America. And I couldn't believe that after a one hour daily of religion, I couldn't remember anything when I left school. And the reason for that is the problem of the day that we don't live religion. In other words, the problem is not out there, it's in here. If there's not enough transformation in us in order to live the premises, if you want to call it that way, the central tenets of any religion. So I have known very religious people in very different religions, and they are lousy people. I mean, any people that you would say, how can I ever meet a person like this? No, I could be judgmental. But in, an, in a, an, a logical analysis, my conclusion was, okay, so religion, this religion at least is not helping this person. On the contrary, the same religion, I found wonderful people. So I'm starting to believe that the wonderfulness of people is unrelated to religion. It's unrelated to a more deep, profound psychological understanding that is more tied to philosophy than it is to religion. Religion is just a way, a way to organize life so we don't get all confused. And it has a, one very good thing, that it congregates people. And we need people. We need good company. But it, I tend to believe that it doesn't pertain to organized religion. It's just my, my belief. It pertains to grow. Even if you want to, if you want to name a god, for instance, I would say Aristotle would be a god. I, I mean, his his teachings are probably interesting, a little boring to read, but as valuable as any religions. So that's my my vision of all religions. They're all branches of the same tree. And um, so, and the, and the impact is not the belief. The religions. Religions tend to tell you what to believe. Uh, they kind of tell you what to practice. If you don't practice it well, you ought to confess in the Catholic religion. But who is actually training you to be a better human? Is it religion? And if it's religion, how does religion practice transformation of the human being? How? I mean, just getting together to pray is great because it congregates people, which is, I think, fundamental in any religion. But how do I become from that Sunday or that day of prayer to the next day of prayer a, a better human being? I still don't know that. But I'm a, again, I'm an amateur researcher. So eventually. I think we are all amateur researchers and, and we are all students, right, in this, in, in this world. And if we all, if any of us, I, I believe, think that we know it all, that's, you know, when we, we have a problem. For me, one of the things that I like in the Baha'i faith, right, is the fact that the Baha'i faith talks about work done in the spirit of service is worship. So when I read that, that's when it, you know, that's when it, for me, clicked, right? It's not just sitting there and, and praying to God. It's taking it out to my work and saying, okay, if everything yeah. I do in my life, I do it in the spirit of service, right? I'm getting paid for it, not getting paid for it, whatever. But if everything I do in my life, I do it, he elevated the work in the spirit of service to the same level as the prayers, right? So to me, that's what religion is, right? That's how we take the guidance, you know, from this, you know, creator, whatever you choose to call it, like Nabil said, you know, are we going to ever understand, you know, the table we will never understand who made it, like, you know, as much as you can try to explain or over the table, it will never really be aware of your existing, but the just the mirror being of the garden is you know, scientific fact that there is something of a higher power that created that. And I think to me, you know, when I walk around gardens, especially in the gardens in Haifa, you know, and talked about 
that's where I see God in every scientific things that I learn. And, you know, if you really think about the human body and how well it function and, you know, how the heart beats and all of these things, when you think of that and you think that something had created, you know, as an engineer, uh, I think of creating a power line, to creating anything, you've got to draw it, you've got to do 3D models, you've got to do material, and all of these things for us to design that, right? And there is a higher power that created this whole amazing universe. So for me, that's just by itself. It doesn't matter what religion you are. That by itself is, you know, reflection on that higher power that we believe in. Go ahead, Marilyn. Uh, a question, does the Baha'i faith believe in an afterlife or the concept of heaven? Nabil, why don't you take that one? <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so I, I did want to say some, I did want to actually say something that uh, I guess in response to what Jose was saying. So, you know, Jose, I, I don't know if you heard, but I grew up in Venezuela. You know, all my friends were Catholic. You know, I go to church with them on Sundays. And, um, you know, what was very interesting for me is my mother actually was uh, was uh, Presbyterian. And so, and, and my mother's family was from Illinois. So, you know, nine months out of the year, with my buddies with my friends i'd go to i'd go to church in venezuela and then three months out of the year i'd go to church uh in illinois both christian mm -hmm. churches both believing in jesus but both with very different um i guess programs let's say sunday morning and um um, so one thing that I learned very early on, and this just ties back to one of the tenets that, you know, May had, had talked about being the independent investigation of truth, is that very early on, my parents would always tell me, you have to ask questions, Nabil, you have to ask questions to find your truth. And so I was exposed to everything. And I was given the opportunity to do that investigation and to do that research and find out, you know, what, you know, what that truth, you know, meant to me or what was my truth. But the one thing that I did want to just kind of comment on or touch on is that I feel that, and again, this was just through the, you know, my own experiences, that the definition of religion or even the word religion, it, it's almost like a loaded word today. Um, and if you think about if you think about religion, it can be taken in, in many different lights, many different contexts, and primarily it's based on, I think, somebody's uh, life experience around religion. But the way that I look at religion is what was the divine or spiritual scripture, the spiritual divine, um, let's say, authoritative texts that that prophet brought to to man you know whether that was jesus or muhammad or moses it's not what the reverend or the pastor is sharing this sunday that's not what it is and so my point is is that over time what has happened and by by no fault of anybody but what has happened is that over time man has taken this this divine remedy or these divine scriptures and changed it Maybe, you know, just a little bit, but over time, those small tweaks and small changes end up creating an environment where, you know, I'm going to a Catholic church hearing one thing, and then I'm going to a Presbyterian church and hearing something else, even though the divine author of, of both of their texts, Jesus Christ, is the same, right? Um, and, but to answer Marilyn's question about life after death, yes, we do believe that um, this material existence for us is, um, is temporary. Um, we do believe that uh, we are all, uh, we all have souls, we all have spirits, and that um, it's, I guess, a, a nice analogy to compare it to is a bird in a cage. So the cage is effectively our body and the bird is our soul. And when our, when we do pass, uh, it's effectively the cage being opened and the bird being released. So, yes, we do believe in life after death. 
Melanie, I don't know if you or May would like to add anything. I know I think that was beautifully put. I was just going to add one thing really quickly that that the word religion does have almost bad connotations nowadays. But as Nabil said, I, it's because I think people are looking at traditions that men have put in their religions, not the virtuous part that God wants us to remember. And so when we're looking at different religions, we're obvious, we're off, oftentimes not really looking at religion in terms of what God wants us to do. We're looking at the man-made ideas behind it. And I know just real quickly, I'll tell a real quick story. Um, so when I finally chose what religion I wanted to be a part of, I decided to go into the Presbyterian church. <laughs> so I was active in the Presbyterian church um, through a lot of high school. And I went to um, confirmation class in the Presbyterian church. And to give you just a teeny bit of background, I grew up in a, a quite wealthy area, of very powerful people. Um, so the, the minister and all very well educated, you know, the whole kit and caboodle. Anyway, so in confirmation class, every time um, we had class, it was always brought up that you must believe that Jesus is the only way to God. And I kept on at every class, I said, I said, well, what about, you know, the people that, you know, follow Moses or Buddha or Muhammad or whatever. And, and the minister would always just, no, 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 quiet. That's no, only Jesus, only Jesus. And this happened three times, the three confirmation classes in a row until finally the minister could never answer about other people, even as well-educated and everything as he was. And he actually threw me out of um, class because I was stirring up the other people into thinking, oh, what about all these other people? What about all these other religions? And so to me, that independent investigation of the truth is so important. You, you can't just, you have to look at the actual, to me, the actual writings of the manifestation and not the man-made parts around it. Uh, to truly understand things. That's Garrett? a great distinction, <laughs> Melanie, that um, between what the religious religions founders taught versus what the modern leaders of the religion are teaching in localities, which, you know, as Nabil said, Christianity <laughs> in South America is very different than Christianity in the United States, and different flavors of Christianity are very different in the United States. So interesting, um, Jose said something about like, how do we become a better human being? That's actually number one of the five intentions of the Free Thinker Institute is to be the best version of yourself, to seek truth and to be fair. So if that mission interests you, you might want to reach out about uh, joining our online community or learning more about membership. Um, as far as the afterlife, we held an event recently on reincarnation, and it turns out in like uh, questions that were asked about that, I did a bunch of research. Um, and it turns out there are a lot of peer-reviewed scientific studies validating that reincarnation is more likely to exist than to not exist, which points to the existence of a soul and to rebirth um, or reincarnation. I'm going to use the two interchangeably, even though there's distinctions there. It's, I think it's a distinction without a difference. Um, the other thing is, um, you know, one of the things we do in the FTI is uh, share various beliefs. So I'm going to share sort of my belief in God is that I think God gives us several innate gifts, the ability to reason, the ability to, the desire to seek truth, and then the ability to recognize fairness. And I would argue those are gifts that God gives us directly, you know, as human beings from birth. And we all have those abilities to, to be able to reason and to seek the desire to seek truth and the ability to recognize something as fair and unfair. And it's only when we distort our views with egotism or other sort of distortions that we veer away from that. Um, and I would argue that all religions are really trying to help people achieve fairness, which is increasing happiness and decreasing harm, in my opinion. Um, and so I would argue that um, that sort of vision for increasing happiness and decreasing harm sort of is a uniter of humanity and even all religions. And I'd be curious to know if any of the Baha'i folks would find contradiction with that in the Baha'i teachings. I have a feeling it's aligned, but I'm curious to hear.
I don't know Maybe. if you want to comment. May, did you want to speak to that? Nabil, go ahead. No, no, no. I was saying May because I had to, I had to get in front of you because I knew you, you were going to put me. That's what I said. <laughs> May, would you speak to that, please? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> You know, I, I love the idea of, I mean, it's it's one of the things that we talk about, the free will, right? We have we were created where we can, I mean, it's something that we have that no other species have. And I think that's the same, you know, come align with exactly what you you're talking about. That's also, you know, that fundamental principle of investigation of the truth. And like I mentioned, you know, we, you're not born a Baha'i. And that's what to me makes it so unique. So at the age of 15, um, you have a free will to choose as a Baha'i. Your parents will actually prepare you. You know, like I mentioned that I, you know, as much as I hated it as a child, I was like, I'm a Baha'i. Why do I have to go to Catholic school? Why do I have to go to church? Why do I have to go to Muslim classes? Why do I have to learn the Quran? You know, but now as I'm an adult and I'm doing the same thing to my kids, I'm, I'm, it really makes sense for me, right? is you can't choose, you cannot have a freedom, you cannot have a free thoughts without knowledge and a true knowledge. And I think what several of us talked about religion, right? What did you, what did Jesus Christ talked about, right? He, he brought peace to the world. That was his message. If you think of it, he died in the cross for our saving, right? What did Muhammad, I mean, the, you know, the greeting that the Muslim greet himself, assalamu alaikum, which is P, which means peace be upon you, right? It's the same thing with Judaism. So when you really look at fundamental of all of these things, it's it's where we where we have these ideas of a free will and, and understanding is when we truly use our mind to investigate the truth and find the truth. And I think that's very much aligned with everything you had talked about. Cool. We had a discussion on free will last year as well. So we've covered a lot of these topics. So Jose, Tocati. Yes, thanks. Um, I always think about this question would be what kind of humans would we be if there was no religion? If there was no religion, period, nobody is following any religion. Would we be savages, barbarians? In other words, do we really know? Do we really need a religion to know what it is to be a better human being? When I think about that, I just remember I only needed my grandmother to tell me what a human, better human being is. But do we need religion? And thinking through it, again in my amateur status, uh, thinking through this, I think what religion adds. It's not the concept of, in my opinion, the concept of God is, is fine, is that I think it adds a number of things that kind of oppress you to be a better human being, like um, ideas of hell, for instance, is definitely an incentive to be a better human being. Uh, other ideas, a lot of punishment throughout, at least my Catholic upbringing, a lot of punishment. Well, right or wrong, that helps me better human being. I better, to be a better human being, I don't like to be punished or burned or whatever. And um, and also at school, the experience of Melanie was similar to mine. I mean, we couldn't ask too many questions. The moment you get to the point where the priest felt a little uh, uncomfortable, they tell you basically, this is faith. You have to believe it in faith. You have to believe it in faith. So I always wonder about this awful question, what is the utility? What is the utility of religion? And to finalize this is, uh, I remember I once heard um, a speaker from the School of Philosophy in Ireland, great guy, he passed away a few years ago. He said, the, all the paths lead to the same place. And he said, there's the path of devotion just you're very religious, you follow a, a, a religious legislature, uh, you follow the principles, but they lead to the same point. Whether you believe in God or not, they want you, you, they want you to become a better human being. That's a path of devotion. And there's the other path, there are some, for some people as well, the path of philosophy. Through philosophy, you get to that idea. You're a human being and you recognize some of your faults and then 
you don't worry too much about thinking about what's happening after you die. You worry a lot about thinking, what can I make? How can I make this life a better life for me and the people around me? Anyway, so what, that was my, my question, maybe a subject to another uh, discussion about what is the utility? The, is, is it because I need to accept that it comes from some higher, I believe in a higher being, by the way, but do I have to accept that these instructions come from a higher being to be a better human being? So if somebody, my grandma, tells me about what it makes to be a good person, I said, well, you are not God. Am I going to debate with her? Right? Because, oh, I'm told this comes from a higher authority. I don't know. But maybe I see one day, Garrett, that we, I can see the, the, um, the Free Thinkers Church coming. So, <laughs> I, I don't think we'll become a church, but we're a not-for-profit, and I like us as that. Um, but, um, but yeah, I, you know, what you're saying really resonates with me, Jose. And, um, I, I want to let them respond, but I'd love to respond as well if they don't mind after they go. Yeah. Are, are you going to volunteer me again, Melanie? She's good at that. Okay, I'm going to volunteer you, Melanie. For the leaders one. delegate. Leaders delegate. Yeah. So uh, I just, uh, you know, Jose, I really like your uh, your question, um, and and I would like to maybe raise another question, which maybe you know uh, the FTI could take into consideration. But I, I think in order to explore that question, one has to explore what is the purpose of man, right? Because the way I look at it is that I, I see the two tied together. Because if the purpose of man is just to survive, then I don't need any instructions, right? I know I need to eat. I need to have security. And, uh, you know, try to, you know, and then and then try to create as many of me as possible, right? I, I guess that would be the, you know, rule du jour if that was my purpose, right? But I, I don't think that that's man's purpose. And so I think that as you, we start to explore what is man's purpose or what is the purpose of our existence, that's where these things start to come into play. Meaning, well, if there is a God, and you know, does does he love his creation or does he not care? Right? Then we can explore that that question. And uh, you know, are, if we are spiritual beings, then what what does that mean? Like, what are we supposed to do in this plane of existence if we are spiritual beings? Like, why not just kill kill ourselves all right now? Right? So we can all live in the you know in the realm of the spirit or move on to, you know, whatever is the, you know, the next life. So I, I think that all of these things need to be, you know, examined um, in order to, to, you know, really, I, I guess, understand, you know, what is the purpose of religion um, and, and how it should play a role in our lives, if that makes any sense. Mel Melanie, did you want to add anything to that? <laughs> no, I just wanted to be able to speak on it. <laughs> If I could, thank you. If I could add a, an opinion in there, um, I actually love the question because I I don't think that we need a religion to be a better human being, and I know lots of atheists that are really good human beings, and I would argue that religion often gives guidance to people to help them be better human beings, and therefore, even though you know my early run-ins with religion were about um, people who followed a religion of love and compassion, but actually were hating lots of large groups of people and turned me away from religion for about a decade of my life. Um, as I learned the wisdom that religion had to offer, I realized that actually helps a lot of people be better human beings. And I met people who were, you know, into drugs and guns and stuff like that, that religion took them out of that world and into a much better place spiritually and like personally and professionally. And so I've seen a lot of good that it can do for people's lives. Um, and I think um, that's why, like I say, that I think God gives us innate gifts and that we need to trust those gifts because if something that religion <clears throat> is teaching we feel like is unfair or unethical, we shouldn't follow that. And that's why I love the Baha'i teaches that we should trust our own judgment. And that's what we do in the FTI as well as we say everyone should trust their own judgment but in the FTI, we also want to help people hone their judgment so they get better at judging fact from fiction and wisdom from folly. Because 
I think we're all on this earth for spiritual development. And our goal is spiritual advancement. And that's about learning. And it's learning knowledge and wisdom and using the two hand in hand with each other. And I tell atheists on a regular basis that are good people, I think I can logically prove that the God that I believe in exists. But I don't think that he cares whether or not you believe in him or whether or not you think he exists or not. All he cares about is that you're a good human being, meaning increasing happiness and decreasing harm in the world. And if you're doing those things, I think you're going to be a okay. You know, come the day that you you move on from this, you know, shuffle off this mortal coil in this incarnation, like no problem. Um, and so, you know, I think it's a really interesting question, Jose, and I hope that made sense. Yeah, I I just wanted to comment on what Jose Please. and Gary said that it is truly like in the faith, in the Baha'i faith, it's it's a faith, right? It's your that's why we don't have anybody between me and God, right? It's a true direct relationship between between you and your creator. So what you talked about, like being atheist or a Muslim or whatever you call yourself, these are all just names that we give ourselves right at the end of the day how do you live your your life and how do you apply whatever it is that you're believing in what's fundamentally make you a better human or not so like we don't believe that oh all the baha'is are going to go to heaven and everybody else for sure not right that's just one thing we wanted to make it clear it's not you know signing your card is not a ticket for you to go to heaven and, you know, we do not believe like in the Baha'i faith, actually the first quote in the book of laws that we have, it talks about these laws are for our well-being, right? So it doesn't say, hey, you do not follow this, you go to hell. Because in reality, none of us, we're all striving to become a human being, Baha'is or non-Baha'is, right? Whichever way we find. But to me, you know, history has been one of my new patient if, passion. If you look at it, after every civilization, like when you look at the station of the Jewish before, uh, you know, the prophet came, he led them out of, you know, their lost and, and misery, and he guided them to the Holy Land. When you think about Jesus Christ, when he came, what was the situation before? What was the situation after? After every major religion, it's truly, you could see a huge civilization, not just from a spiritual, but from a material, from so many ways have been developed. You know, as much as, you know, things are happening now with Islam and people had taken it, I mean, as a Baha'i, we're being the most persecuted by Muslim, but the reality of it, when Islam came, science, technology, uh, you know, just our understanding of so many things, spirituality, people were becoming a better human being, right? The Baha'i faith came and it's talking about, you know, elimination prejudice. It's talk about racism. It's talk about all of these challenges. So when you're looking at it, what we're hoping is after every coming of manifestation, civilization had improved. So to me, that's just one sign of the impact of the guidance of God. Yeah, thank you, May. And to me, it's also a reminder each time of the virtues, because if you leave a bunch of children with no guidance, as we can sometimes see in the United States, for sure, um, no spiritual guidance, no virtues, then they do not grow up, generally speaking, to be good people. It's more survival of the fittest, more animalistic side. Um, so I look at the virtues as coming from God through the manifestations, um, personally. And, you know, that's, that's how I look at it. But as, as, as May said, we don't have any clergy. We don't have any people that we confess to or anything like that. Our relationship is directly with God. God um, we believe the manifestations give us the message of God for that day and remind us of the virtues but our relationship is directly with God. And we never become people that cease to learn. We never become people as Baha'is that cease to question, or, I mean, if we have a question, we, you know, see what we come up with. Um, so there's always that independent investigation of the truth as, as part of the Baha'i faith. 
that we're not blocked by anybody being clergy saying we had to believe this certain way about this certain thing because everybody's in different spiritual levels. So you can take one passage of a scripture and you can read it one time and it means one thing to you. And then maybe you read it five years later, it's going to mean something different to you. And then 10 years later, it's going to mean something different to you because it depends how you're growing spiritually. So that's one, one reason we do not have 30 because we're not going to be told how to understand those kinds of things. It's going to be our own learning that gets us there. Great. And actually, to the wisdom of Islam, I, I learned in Spain that the Islamic scholars in Spain actually translated a lot of the ancient Greek wisdom into the modern world. So they brought a lot of ancient wisdom into the modern world that may have been lost if it weren't for those uh, Muslim scholars. And there was a lot of uh, religious tolerance in in uh, Islamic Spain. There were Jews, there were Christians, there were uh, you know Muslims, and they all got along, um, which was a really nice thing that I would like to see in America. We see in America today, and I'd like to see in more of the world. That said, Jose, go ahead. You're on mute, Jose. Jose, are you there? Sorry, I got lost with all the, the tabs here. There you go. Um, yeah, something about what Melanie said, I, I agree about the virtues and the development of virtues in, in the children. I fully agree that uh, the time from three years old, I would say until you are nine or 10, is a key stage uh, for the development of virtues. Uh, however, I wonder if the only way to develop those virtues is religion. I, um, uh, because definitely they are needed. And in fact, one of the areas that I'm researching now and working with some educational institutions is to introduce philosophy for children. Uh, of course, the, these institutions have their own, are, some are secular, some are not but they both accept introducing a curriculum of philosophy for children. And of course, they are not, uh, the classes are not like, a, well, let's read uh, the following dialogue from Plato. I mean, you're gonna bore to death a 40 year old with that. But it is more like what May was presenting on those books for children about justice, about fairness, about ethics. So, I'm a believer in that. So I'm saying that uh, one doesn't make mandatory the other one. Um, they are both, as I was saying before about this Irish speaker that I heard, that they have different ways to get to the same point. One is through the religion, one is through philosophy. And if you do both, that would be great. But neither is um, exclusive. That's all. Thank you, Jose. I think that's a, that's a very you know, valid point. And, um... Yeah, as long as the virtues are being focused on, that is a main goal yeah. in many ways. Yeah, I would say, Jose, I like to focus on practical philosophy, which is philosophy that adds value to people's lives. A lot of academic philosophy has become maybe intellectually interesting, but with no practical use whatsoever. And even some of it admits that, um, you know, that it has no practical use whatsoever, and that it's simply completely theoretically bound and has no practical application. And I'm much more focused on practical philosophy that adds value to people's lives. That said, Ellis, uh, you have your hand up. Hi, it's Ellis. Um, it's almost nine. So if anyone hasn't spoken yet, now's the time to put up your hand. Um, and I entered uh, in the chat all of our information about free thinkers and our Discord online community uh, where we can continue the conversation. Um, and I also put um, the meaningful conversations that's Melanie's um, meetup um, in the chat. Uh, and just a reminder, uh, next week is going to be solutions to gun violence, to gun violence, and April 11th uh, is going to be about immigration. So we hope to see you all. So one, I just wanted to add something. Thank you, Ellis, for that reminder. And, and it has to do with this whole topic of, you know, is religion needed and, you know, philosophy and, you know, all, all this. And, and I, I love this subject, you know, I think it's wonderful. 
the thing where I'm kind of getting stuck is how can you, how can we consider any opinion outside of the teachings that have been brought to us by any of the, uh, let's say, uh, great religious teachers, prophets? In other words, what I'm saying is, is how can we say, oh, some great philosopher came up with, or some great thinker came up with this idea of thou shalt not kill, or that, you, you know, killing is bad. How can we say that if that's in the Ten Commandments? So, so going back as far as we can in recorded history, I, I, I find it very hard to remove any threads or any influence that any of the great messengers of God have brought or have shared. Because once those messages have been shared with man, it's there forever. I mean, for crying out loud, I mean, on the back of the $1 bill, it says, in God we trust. I mean, it is so ingrained in so many different areas and ways that I, I, I don't, I, I see it very difficult to be able to imagine a world where that was devoid of any religious, and I'm saying religious, meaning teachings from a, uh, a prophet. Does that make sense? Makes sense yes. to me, like, you know, religions teach, like, how to be more fair, how to do better in the world. And once those teachings are effective, they're very sticky, right? Because yeah. people feel the effects. They're like, oh, my life is better doing these things. The life of people around me is better doing these things. And then those things just become the norm. Whereas, like, crucifixion was the norm back in Jesus's day, right? And and then, you know, Constantine, I think, outlawed it in Christ's memory. Um, but, you know, we take for granted all of the advances religion has made. And I don't think we can even imagine what a world without religion looks like. And I think it's worth remembering that all religions are is, you know, people with spiritual gifts that, you know, you know, may or may not, depending on your belief, be God inspired or God himself incarnate. But whatever your beliefs are, these were very wise people that had lots of valuable things to share. And other people, because these people had wise things to share, followed them. And we should still be open to modern people sharing similar wisdom and trusting our own gifts to recognize that as good wisdom and following that too. And, you know, who knows when the next spiritual leader will come about and have great things to teach. And we should have an open mind towards their, their teachings as well as all the teachings of the historical ones, in my opinion. And so I'm just a big believer in learning wisdom anywhere we can get it. And religion has so much to offer that why would we ignore that, even though I did earlier on in my life, <laughs> um, because of my you know negative experiences with religious people early on in my life. Um, but that's, you know, that's people that didn't really embody the love and compassion that their religions taught. Right. And um, and that happens. Right. People we you know, someone mentioned in the chat that so many war, wars were waged in religion's name. Well, yeah, that doesn't make religion bad. That just means bad people hid under the cloak of religion to do bad things. Right. People, you know, Buddhism is a, a completely peaceful you know, a uh, religion where even the Buddha himself said, you know, before you would cause harm, you should literally throw yourself to the wolves kind of thing. I forget the exact quote, but, you know, is very against any kind of violence whatsoever, but still wars were named, made in, you know, waged in Buddhism's name because unethical people got to power and hid under a cloak of Buddhism. That doesn't make Buddhism bad. And just like it doesn't make Christianity bad that the Inquisition was done under their name. It just means that Sometimes people follow their religious leaders rather than their hearts. And if we all followed our hearts and, you know, more the Baha'i, you know, direction of trusting our own judgment, I think there would be a lot less bad done in religion's name because those bad religious leaders would have no followers, right? If people just trusted their own judgment, those religious leaders would have no followers. I think an interesting, interesting the virtues too. Because once you get away from those virtues, you get things like Christian churches that teach white superiority right. and things like that. So 
you know, once again, you have to go back to the, to me, those virtues that were originally given to us through religion, but get corrupted over time because people are people and they will add whatever they want to eventually to the teachings. And then that's, that's why we as Baha'is believe that there are uh, manifestations that come every so often to help us, to remind us and to teach us what we need to know for that day and age. May, did you, you want a closing remark, May? I, I just wanted to say that this was really a very uh, beautiful evening. And I just wanted to say thank you very much. I think uh, anytime you have a group of people who are seeking the truth uh, in such a loving uh, atmosphere, it just leaves you with this really warm feeling uh, that you're in the right space with the right people. So I just really appreciate the opportunity. And thank you. And thank you, um, Ray and Nabil. Thank you, Garrett and Ellis, <laughs> um, for having us. Um, we always enjoy getting together with, as I say, a group of people that are open-minded, that we can share thoughts with, and we can learn from. And we always learn at least as much as anyone else does when we um, do a presentation like this. So thank you so much for having us. Thank you guys for coming. I, I do want to kind of close out, um, but I want to thank everybody for coming, but particularly Melanie, Nabil, and May uh, for presenting on the Baha'i faith. You know, I enjoyed learning more about it. Um, I knew a little, but I know more now. And um, it's just the more I learn, the more I like it. And um, there's a lot of uh, a lot of wisdom to offer um, people who uh, who get involved. So um, would love for people to to you know explore that and um, would love for people that I uh, want to stay involved in the FTI or the Freethinker Institute um, to join our meetup group and um, our online community. You know, we can continue the conversation in the online community about the Baha'i faith. Um, I don't know if uh, Melanie or Nabil or may want to join that, but you're welcome to join the online community and, you know, chat about the Baha'i faith there too. Um, and uh, just want to thank everyone for their thoughtful questions and um, really interesting conversation and comments that everybody had. Um, I just love these events on Tuesday evenings because we get such great um, diverse opinions, but always insightful, interesting, fun, and intellectually gratifying. So I um, just want to thank you all for being a part of it and uh, would love to encourage everyone to keep coming back and keep learning more about both the Freethinker Institute and Baha'i. And um, thanks, thanks everyone for coming. Um, Ellis is sharing some more links um in the the chat but we're going to close out pretty shortly so click on those links quickly if you want to get at them um the first one is for the online community and the second one's about membership so thanks again everybody we'll close out um and hope everyone has a good night and i didn't get the chance to talk uh, i had one person request to learn more about my my uh solution for um ending unjust wars we'll talk about that in the online community so i'll ask you to join the online community um, for the person that asked that and, uh, you know, uh, happy to share the solution there. It's actually very deceptively simple. Um, we just have to get it in front of the right people and have them take action. It's really not, not as hard as you would think. So hope everyone has a great night and uh, take care, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Thank you. Bye-bye.